random thought. What did I do with the microphone? Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, some days you're around old folks and can't remember anything. <laughs> I've been hanging out with Steve Chambers this morning. I want to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the Psalms, Psalm 19, and I want to talk today about, about worship. Because, you see, worship is an important aspect of, of who we are. It's an important aspect of what the church is to be about, about what the redeemed people of all the ages are to do. We're to give God worship. And worship basically means this, that something is worthy. It's greater than, than, I, than I am in myself. It's greater than anything that I can do. So I worship something because of its worth. Now, we're at a time when some kids have gone back to school. We're at a time when others are going back, when the teacher's in the classrooms, and, you know, uh, moms and dads have dropped those freshman kids off for the very first time at a college dorm. And you know what a freshman college dorm looks like? It looks like the place that you don't want to be. You know, they're usually, they're trashed, just to put it bluntly. You know, sometimes they've got fresh paint, but most of the time they don't. And so there's a lot of questions that come about. And in the classroom, there's a lot of questions that come out. It doesn't matter if you're in middle school or if you're in a college class. There are questions that come out as to whether or not there is a God. And if there is a God, does he care? If there is a God, is he involved in human affairs? If there's a God, um, does, does he ever speak? And so this morning, when we talk about worship, I want us to think about we have a God who's revealed himself and a God who cares about us. And in that revelation of himself, he's given us the direction in which we are to go. Throughout the Bible, God has revealed himself. In the prophets, we hear God or the prophets saying, Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. But in the Psalms, we find that the psalmist is reaching out to God. We find that the psalmist is in the middle of all sorts of issues and all sorts of problems in his life, and he's reaching out to God. And there are many times when this psalmist is discouraged. There's times when this psalmist is depressed and disappointed. And he reaches out to God in the middle of all those frustrations, in the middle of all of his failures and all of his illnesses and all of his problems. And this is what he discovers, is he discovers that God is there. And so, you know, as we respond to the questions, is there a God, is God there, does God care, we can certainly come to the place where we can proclaim, along with this psalmist, yes, I know that my God is real, as Joe just sang, for I can feel Him in my soul. But I want to share with you that there are greater ways of knowing that God is real than being able to simply feel and being able to simply acknowledge within our soul that, that God is there. And the psalmist came to understand that, and this is what he understood. He understood that nothing in our lives, nothing in our lives is a surprise to God. Now, it may be a surprise to man, but it's not a surprise to God. You know, a couple of three weeks ago when Steve told me that he was answering a call of God to move to Dothan, it came as a surprise to me. It came as a surprise to some of you. But it didn't take God by surprise, did it? God already knew. God already had things laid out. And just as Steve moves, God's, you know, setting up the, the, next, uh, the, the next line of ministry that, and the family as this church expands and as it grows. So nothing takes God by surprise. And the psalmist declared this. He said, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hand. In the very first six verses of Psalm 19, what we find is that is we find a, a, a portion that's about natural revelation. We can look into the created world, in other words, and we can see God. When I look at the stars and behold the heavens, I can see that, that certainly God has done this. It's not that God is in those things, but God is the one who's created those things. When I look at a, at a flower petal, I see that the creative hand of God had to be a part of putting that flower together. When I walk through the newborn section at the, uh, at the hospital uh, delivery area, and I look through the windows and I see all those little babies, every one of them with their fingers moving and their toes moving, are declaring the glory of God. And so the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. 
And so only a fool would say there's no God. As a matter of fact, twice in the Psalms, in Psalm 14.1 and 53.1, almost two identical um, verses, it says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So if you want to be called a fool by God, you say there's no God. The fool has said in the heart, there's no, no God. So only a fool would look at this world and think it just happened by some kind of a cosmic explosion. To think it happened just by some random act of, uh, of chance, that, that something just came out of nothing. The first portion of this psalm that we're going to study this morning reminds us of this natural revelation of the world that's all around us. But then in verse number 7, the psalmist says this. He says, the law of the Lord. And what he does right there is he says natural revelation of God in this world is great, but the special revelation of God through his word is even more perfect. Simon Peter declared, he said this, he said, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He said, I saw it with my eyes. I feel it in my soul. But just a couple of verses later, this is what he goes on and says. He says in 2 Peter 1.19, But we have the prophetic word made more sure. What's, what's Peter talking about? He's saying it's one thing for me to feel, it's one thing for me to see, it's one thing for me to hear. But I've got the prophetic word, I've got the word of God uh, making more sure. Uh, there's more accuracy, it's more to be trusted. You know, it, it's, uh, it's a greater measure of truth. It's not what I simply perceive with my eyes or my ears or, or what I sense or by what I feel, but I've got the word of truth right here in what God has given me. And so this phrase, the law of the Lord, refers to the, the, the entire word of God from Genesis to the Revelation. It refers to what God is speaking to us. It includes every book of the Bible. It's God's word to us, and it's God's word for us. So as we dig into Psalm 19, you know, as I was putting this together, I'm thinking, this is, Lord, this is really kind of coming out academic in a sense. But I did a thing on Psalm 19, I don't know, when I was in college, somewhere back around 1983-ish. I took a, a course in the summer. It was called River Ryan Ecology. It's basically canoeing uh, down the Etowah River in Georgia. It's put in in Amicalola Creek and canoed into the Etowah. And two weeks later, we ran, landed in Rome, Georgia. It was one of those uh, kind of like underwater basket weaving courses that you take. And, and I took an English credit in it, and I wrote a paper based on Psalm 19. And I've not done a lot of looking at it, you know, in recent years, except I just read it. I, I love it as a psalm. And, and as I began to study on that this week, this is, this is what I understood. I understood that the psalmist is talking, first of all, about our world. And when I talk about our world, it's not just, you know, this planet that I'm walking on, but the world in which we live. It's, it's not just the planet, but it's the stars in the sky. It's the birds of the air. It's all this stuff. And he begins to talk about this world that, that God has given to us. And this is what he says. He says, the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Could you agree with that? I mean, can, when you look at the, at the sun and the moon and, and all the stars, could you agree with that, that the heavens are telling? I really like the, king, the way the King James puts it. They are declaring. They're declaring the glory of God. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Yet there's no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterance is to the end of the world. In him he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to, to run his course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and the circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so he talks about the world, and, and, he talks in, and he talks about this world, you know, is broken down into three things. He says the place of this world is the heavens. For the heavens are telling, they're declaring the glory of God. And, and so the glory of God is written across the heavens. Paul declared in Romans 1.20, he said, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what's been made, so that they are without excuse. You know what I, I understand? I understand that when I look at the glory of these heavens, and when I look at the, 
fingers on a baby move. I have got to understand that there is a God who is a God of creation behind every movement and everything that I comprehend. There's a God there. You know, when you look at our universe, we see the glory of God written all over it. You know, we live in a vast, vast universe, a vast, vast world. Our solar system is basically, you know, these uh, planets rotating around the sun. I'm afraid to call the number of them because they keep changing what's a planet to what's not a planet and back and forth, and I get a little bit confused. But our solar system basically revolves around our sun. And from one side of the solar system to the other side, its diameter is some 7,300 miles across. Comprehend that. I'd had to drive to Birmingham Thursday evening and back on Friday. And, and you know, coming back Friday night, sometimes I, I know it's a short drive, but it seemed like the longest drive in all the world. It may be because I had lunch at, at Cheesecake Factory. And all you want to do after that, well, I tried to be healthy. I had Mexico City chicken. Am I might making you hungry? And I split a cheesecake slice with my wife. What did we get in that cheesecake? It was good. What kind was it? Some kind of chocolate cake cheesecake? Man, that was some good stuff. We ought to pray for a cheesecake factory, right? <laughs> but anyway, you know, sometimes, you know, just a drive of, of a couple of 300 miles seems a long way. But, but think about that. Just across, you know, our solar system is 7,300,000,000 miles across. That's .001 light years. And we live in the, in the Milky Way. And in the Milky Way, there are over 100 billion stars. You know, most of us have never really seen the Milky Way in all of its splendor and all of its glory. A few years ago, I was in North Africa on one of our mission trips, and I was standing there at the edge of the Sahara Desert on top of a Kasbah, which is an ancient fortress, you know, that the travelers would go in and find rest and water and food and stuff. And I'm standing there at night. There's no light pollution whatsoever. There's not street lights, and there are not lights from the shopping centers and all that kind of stuff. It's totally pitch black dark. And I look up in the sky... And I understood why it was called the Milky Way for the very first time. I saw it in clearness. I saw it in splendor. I saw it in its beauty. And in that Milky Way, we know that there's at least 100 billion stars. And it's 100,000 light years across. And it's within a, it has a supercluster of galaxies. And these superclusters of galaxies, uh, there, there's about 2,500 of them. And from the center of the Milky Way to the very edge of that supercluster is 40 million light years. I can't comprehend that. And that's why the Bible says that the heavens, the heavens are declaring, the heavens are telling the glory of God. And their expanse is pointing it out. Isaiah the prophet wrote in Isaiah 40, 12, he said, Who's measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, capital H? Who's measured those waters and, and marked off the heavens by the span of his hand and calculated the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Yet all these things God measures. He measures them in the span of His hands. Our God is a great God. Our God is an awesome God. He's a majestic God. He's a God of wor that's worthy of worship. He's a God that's worthy of us bringing glory and honor and praise to His throne. For He is the Lord God. And that's enough. He's God, and that's enough. But He's not only that, but added to Him, we find all these incredible attributes that we're going to look at in just a moment. But He's a God of glorious revelation. And it's no wonder that He says the heavens are telling the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. And He doesn't leave it there, but He says not only you know, is the place of these heavens a place that declares the glory of God, but God has done it all in precision. There's a pattern to this world in which we live. He says, day to day pours forth. What does it pour forth? It pours forth speech. And night to night, it reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words. I mean, you don't hear the stars talking, do you? You know, it's not there. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them, he has placed a tent for the sun. The pattern, then, that he's talking about is a pattern of precision. Everything in this world works according to 
that precise pattern that God has set forth. When he says pours forth, he says every facet of the universe declares the glory of God. It, it, it speaks, it, it reveals, it bubbles forth with the glory of God. When I looked at that Milky Way in North Africa on the edge of the Sahara Desert, it spoke forth the glory of God. And every one of my kids and my grandchild, as I've held them in my arms, they speak forth the glory of God. I saw a, a little baby out in the narthex at the first service, and, and that little baby sitting in its carrier was speaking out the glory of God. All these kids gathered here a few moments ago with a wonder in their faces and wondering what the pastor's going to do are speaking forth the glory of God. God has put together a creation that speaks of His glory, that speaks of His majesty, that speaks of His work and He is worthy of our worship. Just think about this. There's no disorder in the universe, but it's an intricate uh, pattern that uh, is precise and has absolute principles and specific laws. There's no confusion. There's no chance. There's universal consistency. If our world were tilted just a little bit one way or the other, we couldn't live. If it were 1% off, one way or the other, life would not be possible. Our earth is surrounded by a protective covering, and without it, the sun would destroy us. If the moon were not at its precise distance, there would be tidal extremes, extreme low tides and extreme high tides. And if the moon was not even there, there would be no tides whatsoever. There would be no ebb and flow of the ocean, and the ocean would become a dead uh, body of water. There are, there are thousands of reasons to tell us then that we are not here by accident. Everything in the universe does this. It declares the glory of God. We were made to give Him glory. Amen? Now in the first service I had a Southern Baptist preacher, 47 years, sitting right here. He kept chunking a little bit of wood on the fire. Everything was made to give God glory, amen? And the reason that we exist is to bring glory and honor and praise unto His name, amen? We're here to revel in the glory of Almighty God. We give Him worship. He is worthy. Now, He doesn't leave us there with just the created world. But he exalts the word of God. God's word is exalted in verses 7 three, nine, through 9. Notice the synonyms as I read through this for the word of God. Underline each of these if you'd like. The law, that's the first one. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony, that's the second one. Of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The precepts, that's the third. Of the Lord are rights, so rejoicing the heart. A commandment, the fourth, of the Lord is pure and enlightening the eyes. The fear, the fifth, of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous all together. You know, the world that we live in, y'all, is a magnificent world. When I look out there in the Gulf as Emerald Coast Green, or blue, or whatever we call it when it's so beautiful, man, that's magnificent. I've seen this year, you know, posted up in different places, some of the most beautiful cloud formations as they've come across. At my house every night, I have to yell at the tree frogs to quieten down. They're singing out to the glory of God. But there's something that's more glorious. There's something more wonderful even than a baby's coo more consistent, more solid, more sure. And the day will come when this earth and all that we know of this world will pass away. The Bible tells us it's going to be burned up. Everything we observe in this world that's so loudly declaring the glory of God will one day be destroyed, but the Word of God endures forever. And so, you know, the psalmist goes to a much higher plane as he begins to talk about the, the Word of God. He says the world, the universe, the vastness of it all, it declares His glory, but He says there's something greater, more awesome. We had a, a campaign years ago as we were getting ready to build some stuff, and, and we had an awesome goal, an awesomer goal, and an awesomest goal. And what the psalmist is basically jumping from, he's jumping from that which is awesome to that which is awesomest, and there's no such word. 
He's talking about this Word of God. Now look at what he says about the Word of God. He says the Word of God has certain attributes. You know, that's the character of the Word of God. He says the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. You know, it's perfect. It's the perfect Word from God. It has no errors. It's accurate. It covers all of life. The law of the Lord is perfect. In other words, God meant what He said. And he said what he meant. Now, there are times when my wife doesn't understand what I meant I said. Men, do you understand that at all? Can you identify with me there? You know, they don't understand what we meant. And we get in trouble, right? But God said exactly what he meant. Now, we back up as guys, don't we? Don't we? But God doesn't back up. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. And so the law of the Lord is perfect. Understanding that law is not necessary to knowing that it is true. So oftentimes we want to understand the things of the Word of God so we can decide whether or not we will accept it as truth and whether or not we will walk in obedience to that truth. But God says that we understand his, we're to understand His Word of truth. And, and, and we come to Him with an open heart and with an open mind, and He leads us in that way of life. And then He says this, The testimony, the testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. The, the word sure is a foundational word. In other words, if I lay this word as the foundation in my life, it's at the foot of my life, I can build my entire life through God's power upon His Word. It's not going to lead me astray. It's going to guard me. It's going to guide me. It's going to enlighten me. It's going to protect me. It's going to bless me. And so he talks about that sureness. And then he says the precepts of the Lord are right. They rejoice the heart. That word right means to make the path straight. Now, so oftentimes we go on, we go on shortcuts that become long cuts, don't we? You know, we're going to take this shortcut as we're traveling, and it ends up being 50 miles out of the way. We're going to take this shortcut in life, and it cost us more than we were willing to pay. We, we try this shortcut and that shortcut. But the word of the Lord is, is, uh, is right. In other words, it makes a path straight. If we follow that word of God, we don't have to take unnecessary detours. If we follow that word of God, we don't have to, to go out of our way to get to the place that God wants us to be. When we study and apply and appropriate the Word of God, appropriate means I put it to work in my life. You know, we can be sure that we will not be led into erroneous positions. And then he says the commandment of the Lord is pure. It enlightens the eyes. In other words, God's Word is unadulterated. There's no mixture of error. There's no unwholesome element in the Word of God. If we study it and if we obey it, appropriate it, we will never bring that which is evil and unpleasant and unwholesome into our lives because that word is there keeping us and making us pure. But he doesn't stop there. He says the fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. In other words, you know, there's no mixture of error and a note it endures forever. The physical universe is going to pass away, pass away but the word of God endures forever. And the judgments of the Lord are sure are true, and they're righteous altogether. In other words, they're utterly dependable. Now, I may let you down, and you may let me down. You may not tell me the truth. I may not tell you the truth. I may not do what I say I'm going to do, and you may not do what you say that you're going to do. But here's the deal. We can always count on God's Word. God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, I want to give you some encouragement in that. Because, you know, we all face those moments in our lives when we wonder ourselves, God, are you there? God, do you care? Are you real? Because I don't feel. But see, the more perfect thing above the created world is the perfect Word of God that tells us that God is always there and He cares and He's real, whether or not I can feel or not. And you know, you come up and you get bumped and you get battered and you get bruised in life. And that same God who set this whole thing in motion and keeps it together is a God that cares about your bumps and your batterings and your bruises. My granddaughter Zoe, she's got this thing for showing pops her boo-boos. You know, it can be a two-week-old boo-boo. Pops, I got a boo-boo. You know, and I rub that boo-boo, and 
Say, I'm sorry. Does that make you feel better? Yes. You know, our God is that kind of God. He cares about the boo-boos in our life. And He's real. And He feels for us. And He doesn't stop right there. He says there's an attractiveness to that Word. Have you ever found God's Word attractive? Is that a good question? I mean, we know the church answers to say, yes, the, the Word of God is attractive. It's so attractive I read it and I study it and I obey it. But is it really that attractive to us? This is what he says about the attractiveness of the Word of God. He says they're more desirable than, than gold. Yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there's great reward. He says the Word of God is more desirable than gold. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that we spend our lives trying to gain the gold that comes from the ground and a gold that we cannot keep, and we ignore the greatest treasure in all the world, the Word of God, which is more valuable than gold. And he goes on, and he says, you know, you know, we think if, if we just had gold, we'd be really happy, wouldn't we? And if we had fine gold, we'd be really, really happy. But he says the Word of God is, is of greater treasure than that. It, it's more to be desired than the finest of golds. They're more attractive than anything this world has to offer. And he says sweeter than honey. You know, honey's one of the sweetest things that you'll ever put in your mouth. It's good. I mean, there's all kinds of different honeys, but honey is sweet. Now, if David were writing this today, he might say, you know, it's, it's sweeter than a peanut butter parfait from Dairy Queen. Don't you wish they'd build a Dairy Queen here? That'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? To go along with everything else and a cheesecake factory. You know, you think of those sweet things, and this is what God's saying. He's saying His Word is sweeter, it's more satisfying than, than all the sweetness in all the world. God's Word is sweeter. And by that, and, and moreover than that, we're warned by it. You know, moreover, by, your, by them, your servants warned. You know, don't we want to know how to live? Don't we spend our entire life trying to figure out how am I going to live? And what I'm going to do, and how am I going to invest my life? That, then if we want to live life to its fullest, and we want to live out the real plan that God has for it, the, the, the deal is we've got to stay in the Word of God. You know, the reason we sin is because we're not staying in the Word, and the Word is not staying in us. And His Word warns us of evil. And then He goes on and says, when we keep His Word, there's great reward. You know, we all want to be rewarded. And here's the reward that God gives us. He gives us the reward of wholeness. He gives us the word, reward of happiness and meaning and purpose. And that's what we go through life trying to strive for. We want wholeness. We, we, want to, we want to be great at sports. We want to be great at speaking. We want to be great at sales. We want to be great at doctoring. Whatever it may be, you know, we want to be whole in, in that area. And we want to be happy. You know, you talk to people and they say, I just want to be happy. And people want a meaning in their life. They, they want their life live on purpose. But when we live according to the will of God, to the Word of God, we find that He gives us wholeness. He gives us happiness. He gives us meaning, and He gives us purpose. So, the final thought I, I draw from this psalm as I've looked at it is that God expresses His work. And it's found in the last couple of verses of the text. In verse 12, He says, Who then can discern His errors? Not in capital H, but a, in a lowercase h. That means, you know, you and me. Who can discern His errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also keep you after your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. And then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. You see, God's word has a purpose. The heavens declare the glory of God. His, his, his Word shows us perfection, but His Word is worked out in our lives. The purpose of God's Word is to help us know ourselves. Who can discern His errors? In other words, who really understands Himself? You know, oftentimes we don't understand ourselves. You know, sometimes we blurt out stuff and we say, Whoa, where did that come from? 
I didn't know that part of my personality. You know, some days we wake up and we feel great. And we, we, we've made a, a, a commitment to ourselves that this is going to be a great day. It's going to be an awesome day. And I'm not going to be a jerk. And then we get held up in the drive through at McDonald's trying to get a cup of coffee because we're on a, in a hurry. And we feel the jerk coming on. We're saying, where did that come from? You know, have you ever been there? Can you identify with that? You know, who can really understand himself? Who's capable of, of putting that together? Who of us has done things, you know, that, that, and we've gone back after we've done them and say, why did I do that? You know, why did I say that? Why did I behave in that kind of a way? And who of us have not discovered a secret fault within our own lives? You see, the work of God through His Word is to, to, is to detect and to remove the error in our lives both the forced eras and the unforced eras. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's a baseball terminology. And I know some of you don't understand that. But what I'm saying is this. Sometimes it's just unforced in the sense it just happened. But sometimes it's forced in the sense that we made it happen. You understand where I'm going with this? So when... The psalmist says, you know, Lord, acquit me of my hidden faults. You know, he says that we have to have protection from our secret faults, those things that we do almost automatically. We do them almost casually. We do them almost with carelessness. Lord, help me through this so that I will not be led to those things that are forced, those presumptuous sins. You know, most of the sinning is the stuff that we don't intend to do. You know, it just happens. And then we say, oh Lord, forgive me. And so the purpose of the Word of God is is to so work in our lives that we see what our needs are and and, and what we are easily led away to and that that Word leads us back into the throne room, into the the presence of God. And, And it protects us in that Word. He says, also keep your servant from presumptuous sins. You know, here's a sin that's different in its nature. It's not the things that I just kind of wander into. You know, in the Old Testament Le- Levitical system, there's no sacrifice for presumptuous sins. There's a sacrifice for sin in a person's life, but not for the presumptuous. The presumptuous was those things that were done, you know, deliberately. They were done with arrogance. It, it's like your kid responding to you when you tell your kid to do something, and they look you in your eye. And it may may be when they're this tall, and it'll happen when they're that tall. And it may be when they're this tall, and it may be when they're that tall. Right? And when they look in your eye, and they say, no. That's presumptuous. That's arrogant. That's willful. That's forced sin. And so David's saying, God, keep me from that. I don't want to be at the place where I say, God, I will not do. Woo, that's a tough place to put yourself. I will not. I will not. I will not do. I will not go. I will not pray. I will not read the word. I will not be in worship. I will not because of somebody else. That's no excuse. That's presumption. That's arrogance. That's deliberateness. And you know, God has laid out a whole bunch of stuff that that we're not to cross the line on, whether it's murder or adultery or stealing or slander or gossip or brutality or abuse or a thousand other things. But so oftentimes, we'll move a little bit closer to that line and sometimes we'll say, God, I'm just going to do it anyway. I know you said I couldn't. But I'll ask you to forgive me in the morning. That's presumption. And if we allow the Word of God to grow within our hearts and lives, He will save us from the presumption of sin. And that leads us finally to the consideration of the praise that comes forth from the Word of God. You see, when I think of, of the world, of the vastness that God has created, when I think of the beauty of His creation and all that He has made, I want to give God praise. 
And when I see how his word affects me and, and, and how it guides me and, and how I've heard that saving word that whosoever shall call upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. They believe in their heart and confess with their mouth they shall be saved. That word's alive and it's active and it's working within me. It wants to me to, to give God praise. So when we consider these things, all these things lead us to a place of worship. Worship is what we are created to do. And so the psalmist wraps it up. And he says, let the words of my mouth and let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock, my foundation, the one upon whom I've built my life and my Redeemer, the one who's picked me up out of the pit. So in worship, we see the God of creation that's created this universe. And every wonder in this beautiful world is a reminder of the glory and the majesty of God. And beyond that clear revelation of God's world is, is the revelation of God's Word. And this ought to cause me and cause us to love the Word of God and to seek to plant it in our hearts and in our lives. And as we do that, God's work will be made plain to see in us and our hearts this is where it really gets beautiful our hearts become hearts that even as the heavens do they declare the glory of God so as you go this week as questions are answered that are asked may your life be the kind of life that declares the glory of of God and that honors God and that praises God and that lifts God up. This morning, there's some of you that have never trusted Christ Jesus to be your Savior. And this is the day you're just one prayer away of asking Christ to come into your heart and into your life and to be your Redeemer forever. And He'll do that. You can pray it right where you're at. Others of you need to take steps of obedience to God, whether it's in church membership, or whether it's through an act of baptism, or whether it's surrendering to service, whatever it may be, God's speaking to your heart. After I pray, Steve's going to come and lead us in a hymn. And as he leads us in that hymn, it's going to be our response to come to Christ and make it public just the way we are. Let's pray. Father, to you be the glory and the praise, and the honor, and the worship forever and ever. Help us, Lord, in our hearts to be obedient unto you. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen.